Hello, everybody. Good evening. Welcome to tonight's program within Forum at the Commonwealth Club. I'm Mark Zitter, chair of the Zetima Project and a member of the club's Board of Governors. I'm thrilled to be here tonight in conversation with Dr. Vivek H. Murphy, who served as the 19th Surgeon General of the United States uh, and was just relieved of his duties a few weeks ago, <laughs> along kind of part of a growing parade from the current administration. <laughs> At age 39, he's really had a remarkable career. As a young adult, he co-founded the global healthcare nonprofits Visions and Swathsia. Is that correctly? Yeah, good. He went on to co-found a software technology company in the private sector, Trial Networks, which improves research collaboration. And he's also co-founded yet another not-for-profit called Doctors for America, which has over 18,000 physicians and medical students. He did all this while practicing medicine and conducting research. Now, if all these amazing accomplishments are making you feel stressed out, <laughs> don't worry, you came to the right place, because tonight we're going to be talking about Dr. Murthy's new favorite subject, current favorite subject, emotional well-being, combating chronic stress, and fostering social connection. So here we go. You ready? I'm ready. Great, thank you. First, I want to thank you for being here instead of being at the Warriors playoff game. <laughs> <laughs> I happen to know you're a Steph Curry fan, because there's actually a video of you uh, dancing with Steph Curry at an Oakland elementary school promoting exercise. You also are featured in a video or a couple of commercials with Elmo um, promoting vaccine. It sounds like a really fun job, <laughs> but I gotta say, I would think that one of the most fun things about the job is the title. Surgeon General is a badass title, I and mean, that is a great title. <laughs> the only thing is, you know, I know what surgeons do, and I know what generals do, and I know the Surgeon General doesn't do either of those things. <laughs> so what does the Surgeon General do? What's the role? Well, it's a good question. I, and I get the question a lot because everyone has heard of the title Surgeon General from boxes of cigarettes or alcohol containers. <laughs> <laughs> Whenever people tell me that story, they're like, you know, I saw on somebody else's cigarettes that there was a <laughs> warning from the Surgeon General. I was like, I know it was yours. It's okay. <laughs> but. Most people know the title for that reason, but they don't know what the Surgeon General does. So there are really two primary responsibilities. Uh, the first is to provide the public with the best possible scientific information on health so people can make good decisions uh, for themselves and for their families. And the second uh, is to oversee uh, one of the seven uniformed services in the U.S. government, and that is the U.S. Public Health Service Commission Corps. And the Commission Corps uh, is really one of the nation's best kept secrets. It's a group of 6,600 officers who are doctors and nurses and physical therapists and pharmacists, but who are all dedicated to improving public health in their communities. During their day jobs, they may work at the CDC or the FDA uh, or the Indian Health Service or other parts of the federal government. But from time to time, when emergencies arise in our country, whether it's 9-11, a hurricane that destroys a city, a tornado that devastates a town, or as was the case when I was uh, in office, the Ebola crisis or the Zika crisis. During those times, we deploy our officers to go and to provide care, to help educate communities, and to often help rebuild the infrastructure. Uh, serving as Surgeon General and having the opportunity to work and oversee uh, the Commission Corps was really one of the great privileges of the job. Uh, and I will just say on a personal note, that it was an unexpected privilege uh, to have because I was not somebody who grew up thinking uh, that I would have the opportunity to be Surgeon General or that I even wanted to be Surgeon General. Um, I also, going further back, was not somebody who came from a family background uh, where something like this was possible. My parents uh, came from pretty humble backgrounds. My grandfather was a poor farmer in India uh, in a small village. He grew rice, coconut, and tamarind. Uh, my father assumed that that's what he would do when he grew up. And if our life was governed by probability, I would be a farmer in a small village in India as well. Mm -hmm. But my father, in the midst of that bracing poverty that they lived in, uh, where they often didn't have enough to eat or to clothe themselves, uh, he found himself dreaming of opportunity uh, in a land far away. And he was dreaming of a place like America. And he had the chance, along with my mother, to come to this country 40 years ago, uh, driven not uh, by, really not by anything other than hope that this was a place where he could build a better life for himself, for my mom, and for my sister and me. And it's because uh, this country, over the years, has made it a point uh, to be a beacon for those values of equality, opportunity, and respect for all, that we were able to find people who embraced us, who took us in. I was able to find public school teachers uh, who gave me a shot, 
uh, even when I had trouble, you know, with language and other, other issues. Uh, I was able to find uh, opportunity to get a higher education at a good school, even though my parents weren't rich. Uh, and all of that uh, has given me the incredible opportunity to serve uh, as Surgeon General for the last two and a half years. So I am incredibly grateful for the opportunities I've had uh, in this country. And one of the reasons uh, that I have been thinking about emotional well-being and stress is because I think our ability uh, to look past a lot of the noise uh, that we're dealing with right now and preserve those core values of our country, surround, which, uh, which involve really focusing on equality and opportunity and respect for all, those values are what need to guide us uh, because we need to make sure that those are still at the foundation of our country for ourselves and for future generations. I have an eight-month-old son. Uh, before he was born, my wife and I sat down after one of the many shootings that happened uh, in 2016 uh, where uh, yet another young man was killed uh, in a community after being pulled over. And, and shortly after, uh, two police officers were also killed in Dallas. And we asked ourselves, what kind of world are we bringing our son into? Uh, and while we can't fully answer the question of what the future holds, what we did commit to that day and every day since then was doing everything we could to make sure that he was brought up and that he had the opportunity to live uh, in a country that reflected those deeper values that gave us the opportunity that we had that made this country the kind of place that my parents and so many other immigrants wanted to come to. Mm -hmm. Well, you clearly are a very values-driven person. You told us a little bit about your background. I'm curious about the early influences in your life. Who and what shaped you, and how did they help you become the person you become? That's a good question. You know, I think we're all the product of the people we grew up with and the environment that we grew up in, and I'm no different. <clears throat> my grandfather, and on both sides, my maternal and paternal grandfather, uh, and my maternal and paternal grandmother were strong influences uh, for me. My paternal grandmother actually was not alive uh, you know, when I was born, uh, but the stories my father told of her uh, really brought her to life for me. What they modeled, really, my grandparents, uh, was an ethic of hard work and citizenship. And my, grand my dad's father, in fact, used to say to him often, he was like, my most important uh, hope for my kids is that they're good citizens. And what he meant by that is he meant that when they see challenges that arise around them, that they don't wait for other people to solve those problems, but they ask themselves, what can I do to be of help to my community? To him, that was a good citizen. And he modeled that way of living. Despite the poverty my parents grew up, my father grew up in, my grandfather spent a month out of each year traveling around to different villages to raise money to build a youth hostel so other students could study. Uh, and people often said to him, you're being so irresponsible. Your kids can't even eat, and yet you're raising money for other kids. And he would always say to them, no, those kids are our kids too. Those people are our people too. And unless we think of them that way, unless we think of this community as our collective family, uh, then we can't all rise together. And that value was really lived in real life by my mom and dad. And so I think of my mother and my father and my sister as really uh, the folks who taught me the most as I was growing up. And I've been blessed to have two more teachers added uh, to that uh, portfolio, my wife and my eight-month-old son, who teach me each and every day, mm -hmm. and remind me, really, of uh, the importance of being a good citizen and of creating a world that we can all be proud of for ourselves and for our kids. That's great. So by the time you were in your mid-30s, you had become a person who was then appointed uh, the youngest uh, Surgeon General in U.S. history, and you started out immediately and famously with a listening tour. You went around the country listening to people. What did you learn, and how did it affect your priorities while you were serving? Well, I learned a lot. I remember that um, moment very clearly uh, when I was in, walked in sort of for the first official day of duty, uh, and I sat down with a very well-meaning team uh, that said to me, okay, you know, you've gone through this really public confirmation process, and, you know, folks are really excited that you're finally here, although some people are really not excited that you're here because it was a <laughs> controversial uh, confirmation process. Mm -hmm. But they said, you know, the, the country wants to know what you're going to do. So why don't we book you on all of these big shows and we'll get you out there and you can just tell the country what you're going to do. And I said, well, I'd like to do it a little bit differently than that. Uh, I said, I have ideas for what I want to do. Uh, I have an agenda that I'd like to pursue, but I want to make sure that agenda truly does reflect what people want. And the only way that we're going to know that uh, is not if I sit here in D.C. and read reports and do that kind of thing. It's only if we get out there and, and listen to people and talk to them. And that's, so that's what we did. We spent the first few months traveling around the country, big cities, small towns, uh, and asking people the simple question, how can we help? What do you need? 
And <clears throat> it was an incredibly educational experience. I also, most places I went had the chance to meet with our Commission Corps officers, uh, who were also just incredibly inspiring, but also very informative in helping us understand the needs of their local community. And I heard a lot of things. I heard, for example, that almost every community was struggling uh, with substance use disorders and addiction. It didn't matter if folks were rich or poor, or if there was, these were urban areas or rural areas. I also heard uh, that people were struggling with mental illness uh, in their communities. And people would often approach me and almost whisper to me that their family members or they themselves were struggling uh, with the mental illness. And what that spoke to really, both in the case of mental illness and addiction, was a terrible stigma that surrounds, unfortunately, both illnesses. And it makes it hard for people to talk about and harder for people to seek out help. Uh, so we heard a lot about that. But there was also something that we didn't hear about, but that we sensed really deeply. And that was that people were in pain everywhere I went. And then I'm not talking about physical pain alone, although there was clearly a lot of chronic physical pain. But I was talking, talking about a deeper emotional pain that people were experiencing. And that was complex. It was the product of, in some cases, poverty, in some cases, violence, in some cases, discrimination, in some cases, chronic illness. But all of these experiences together, all of these stressors, uh, if you will, were generating chronic stress among people, and they literally felt like they were in pain. And if you wonder about how somebody in emotional pain can feel like they're in physical pain, then you actually just have to understand more about the neurobiology of the brain and the circuitry in the brain, and you start to see that, in fact, the pathways through which we experience physical pain and emotional pain actually overlap. And so if you're a, a doctor or a nurse, and there may be some doctors and nurses here in the audience, I know I see two right here in the front, uh, but if you're a doctor or nurse thinking about how you treat somebody's physical pain, you quickly start to realize that it's important also to pay attention to their emotional state. Uh, and if somebody's emotional state is contributing to their physical pain, it doesn't make it any less real or any less important to address. But it just means that we have to look at the whole person uh, when we're thinking about pain. And that's the stories of pain were what we were hearing all the time on the road. Um, how, I, that how did that translate to priorities for what you would actually do? So part, driven in part by that conversation, we made substance use and addiction key priorities. It was one of the reasons why in November of 2016, I released the first Surgeon General's report on substance use and addiction to aggregate the best science that we had on how to diagnose and treat addiction, but also framing addiction for our country, not as a moral fa failing or a character flaw, but really as a legitimate chronic illness. And if that seems obvious to you, it's not obvious to most people. Uh, and in fact, it's not even always so obvious to people who work in hospitals and clinics themselves, uh, many of whom sometimes look at addiction more so as a disease of choice than other chronic illnesses. And I picked that up even very early on when I was in medical school, just through the language and watching people's body, uh, body language and how they uh, treated folks who came in with addiction. So that drove the, the, the publication of that, of that report, and it also drove a campaign that we launched in 2016 in the summer called the Turn the Tide Tour, which was a, uh, the Turn the Tide campaign, rather, which was an initiative we launched to specifically combat uh, the opioid epidemic and to work with prescribers, with doctors and nurse practitioners and others to change prescribing practices and to start treating pain uh, more judiciously when it came to opioid medications. But it was the conversations uh, that we began to have around the pain that we were seeing, particularly around the emotional pain, that really drove my interest in chronic stress and emotional well-being. Uh, and I quickly came to realize that if we are going to uh, deal with some of the great challenges we're facing with chronic illness, and even outside of chronic illness, that we have to address emotional well-being. Because as it turns out, it's deeply connected uh, to all of the outcomes we care about. And I'm happy to talk more about that as well. In this well, we'll be asking more about that over yeah, the promise. I figured. <laughs> but you know, just on a more personal note for, for you, um, we started out this evening prior to, this, uh, to our session here asking everyone in the audience to talk a little bit about things that, that might be stressful to them. So I want to put you on the spot and ask you two related questions. What has been stressing you out lately? You've had some changes in your life lately. Mm -hmm. And then also on a scale of one to 10, with 10 being great and zero being not so great, uh, how well do you personally manage your stress? That's a really good question. Um, and you'd be, it's actually a question I get a lot because people want to know like, well, what are you doing? And, and the first thing I always tell them is that uh, I'm not a model of perfection. Right? And the journey to better health is a journey that we're all on. And we're going to fall off that wagon sometimes. But we got to get back on. And we got to, most importantly, help each other get back on. 
Because for anyone here who has tried to start a new diet plan or an exercise plan, and just by show of hands, how many people have tried to start it at any point in your life? And if you're not raising your hand, I know. For those on the radio, it's almost everybody in the room. <laughs> but the thing is, for anyone who's tried to start a new plan, uh, you know how easy it is to fall off. So lifestyle change requires us to actually help each other. In my case, in particular, um, in terms of what's been stressing me out uh, lately, it's been it's been a few things. You know, I think one. You know, certainly I have had some changes in my life. I'm now no longer serving as Surgeon General. And that actually, in part, that's actually a, a bit mixed, you know, because uh, I, while I'm disappointed to, to leave my team and to not have a chance to serve my country in the way I have for the last two and a half years, I'm also excited about new opportunities uh, that are, are, are coming up and a new opportunity in which I believe I can serve uh, the country, particularly around emotional well-being. So there's actually a lot of opportunity, but opportunity can be stressful, you know, and, and those of you who have ever had to pick between two colleges or two universities or two jobs, whatever it is, you know that choice is great, but it sometimes can be stressful. Uh, and so as when I think about change now, I'm not, not just thinking about myself, I'm thinking about my wife and my our baby son. Uh, and so thinking about like how to sit, find a situation that's going to be good for all of us, uh, you know, that generates a little bit of stress. Sure. Um, but in terms of where I am, zero to 10, yeah. that was your question, right? Uh, I would say in terms of uh, overall wellness, you know, if zero is like 100% stressed out and 10 is 100% uh, well, I would say probably somewhere between a seven to an eight right now. Okay. Uh, and I think that has in part come because I'm on, um, I'm also, I've been on a commencement swing uh, this past week where I've been giving commencement uh, speeches at different universities. And commencements are just such a, inspiring and exciting time uh, to be with people who are looking forward to the rest of their lives and their careers to be with proud families and that's really that's been really, really been a treat and a privilege that must be great well we promised to get into stress here uh so let's unpack it a bit i know you talk a lot about the different types of stress long-term short-term acute chronic and so forth and are they all equally good or bad and what can we do about them so there are different types of stress and acute stress or short-term stress can actually be quite helpful Right? Before you give a big speech or take an exam uh, or play a game, you know, basketball or football or whatever it might be, uh, you might feel some stress. Uh, and that sometimes can push you to perform better. But the problem with stress is when it becomes chronic, is when it goes on for too long. Because when the systems in your body are revved up too much, when your stress system, which activates your uh, hypothalamic pituitary uh, adrenal axis is revved up and you have high levels of cortisol uh, too much of the time, then it can start to become damaging uh, to your body. Chronic stress can essentially accelerate inflammation and aging. It can increase your risk uh, of chronic illnesses uh, like diabetes and uh, more specifically like cardiovascular disease. And this is one of the reasons why uh, chronic stress is an important health concern because it's not just about making you feel better in the moment. It's also about preventing chronic illness in the future. There's another reason that chronic stress is important, though, uh, and that's because it impacts our decision-making and how we engage with other people. So all of us have had experiences in life where we have been in a bad emotional state and have made bad decisions as a result of that. And as a result, many people have this rule, like in their life, where they say, you know, if I'm in a really bad space, I'm not going to make any decisions. I'm going to wait until I get into a better place. Now, I want you to imagine when, as a country, we are in a bad emotional place, what kind of decisions do we make? Mm -hmm. Well, we're not always going to make good decisions. So if we are faced with a major disaster, uh, with a, a tragedy, a hurricane that levels a town, and when we have to pull together to address uh, that tragedy, uh, if we are in a chronically emotionally stressed state as a nation, we're going to do that a whole lot less effectively. Uh, than if we, if we weren't. Uh, when we're also stressed, we tend to pull into our corners uh, and look out for ourselves instead of, in fact, coming together to take on big challenges, which is often what we need to do. And when I think about today, 2017, we do face a lot of big challenges, like in our country and in the world. Uh, we have struggled you know, with education in our country and have worried uh, that we're not doing as well and preparing our kids for the future. Uh, with healthcare, we have millions of people who are uninsured or underinsured, uh, and we have to do something about that because our healthcare costs are through the roof, and most importantly, we have far too many people who are suffering and whose lives are cut short because of illness. We've got big problems that we have to come, come together to, to resolve. If we don't 
address our emotional well-being as individuals and then collectively as a country, it's going to be hard for us to really pull together during tough times and meet those challenges. And that's one of my great concerns. And that's why, to me, emotional well-being is at the root of everything we care about. If you are not emotionally well, and if you are chronically stressed, we know it contributes to your increased incidence of disease. But emotional well-being is also related to educational outcomes, to workplace productivity, to civic engagement. And these are things that we should all care about. So that's why we're foc I, I want to focus on emotional well-being, because I see it as a root cause of what we need to address in order to make our country healthy and strong. I think the last November's election was in many ways a wake-up call to many people, particularly in the relatively affluent Bay Area, that uh, many, many Americans are not doing well, uh, do, do not have great emotional well-being and are stressed. Um, we're also hearing uh, that, uh, I guess, for the first time in, in our nation's history, a long time, we've got large swaths of our demographics, particularly white men uh, who are lower income, actually have a declining life expectancy. Mm -hmm. That's new. That hasn't really happened before that we're aware of. Um, and a lot of addiction. And I'm assuming that these things are, are, are connected, that the addiction isn't just random, I got high and I got hooked on a drug, but they're actually part of the, the despair that we're feeling. Is that right? That's absolutely right. And when I think about addiction, uh, addiction is really a disease of despair that's driven by a deficit of hope that many people feel. And chronic stress is very much linked uh, to it. When, when I've spent a lot of time uh, with people who have lived with addiction and who are in recovery now, with people who are still struggling with addiction and have relapsed, uh, and I've spent time with their families as well. And what many people will tell you is that it is often stress that drives them uh, to use again or that often will get them into experimenting with alcohol or drugs in the, in the first place. Uh, so stress is an important contributor here. And when you look at the uh, increased mortality rates that you were mentioning, uh, you know, among uh, middle-aged uh, men you know, who are white and also in other populations, what you realize is that addiction and suicide are two of the key drivers of those statistics. And so if, as we think about how to address that, we, this again points to the fact that Stress is really linked to many of the health, public health issues that we care about, whether it's addiction uh, or violence you know, or, you know, or chronic diseases like heart disease and diabetes. It's a, it's, a, it's a large problem, and you have talked about social connection or social connectivity as an antidote to that stress. Is, that this, I mean, is stress the same as loneliness? Um, and how does social connection really help us? Well, it turns out that among the many sources of stress that people experience, loneliness is actually one of them. And you might ask, well, how could that be the case? Well, as, as human beings, we evolve to be social creatures. And you can understand why this might be the case, because we, when you, in, the, in sort of the caveman days, if you will, uh, having other people that you were connected to was likely to help ensure that you had a stable food supply that you would be able to keep watch collectively overnight and not get killed by a predator. So the connection made sense. And because in part we've evolved that way, when we are disconnected from other people, that actually puts us in a stress state. Now, loneliness, you might think, yeah, some people experience it, maybe it's not that common, but I would tell you that it actually is more common than you think. In the 1980s, 20% of adults reported feeling lonely. Today, that number stands at 40%. Despite the fact that we live in one of the most technologically connected times in the history of civilization, yet 40% of adults uh, have said that they feel lonely. Now, what does it mean to actually be lonely? Well, it's not defined by how many friends you have or by the population density of your neighborhood. Uh, you can have one friend and be perfectly content. You can have 100 friends and be absolutely lonely. Uh, so this is really a subjective uh, definition, but the ex chronic loneliness is in fact linked uh, to poor health outcomes. People who are lonely live shorter lives, and the reduction in lifespan that's related to loneliness is comparable to the effect of smoking cigarettes or obesity. That's how powerful loneliness is. It's also the case that people who are lonely have a stronger, a higher risk of developing cardiovascular disease, or developing dementia, anxiety, depression, and a host of other conditions that we care about. And the question is, what helps? Well, I'll tell you what doesn't help, throwing a whole bunch of people in a room and 
hoping that they get along. That's not always the solution to loneliness. Mm -hmm. It turns out if you look at their research more closely, what seems to make the most impact on reducing loneliness are mutually beneficial relationships. Now, what are those? Those are relationships where people feel like they are both contributing something to each other's lives. And this is important because if you imagine a situation where you have uh, someone who's in a hospital and who has doctors and nurses and social workers and care coordinators all looking after them and caring for them, uh, that might make them feel good that so many people care. But it doesn't seem to make them feel less lonely when you actually look at the data. What does help people feel less lonely is when they feel like they are also giving something to those individuals. So there's an organization called Experience Corps, which places seniors in schools where they can, the seniors can help tutor uh, students, but the students can also help teach seniors about technology and uh, provide them with company uh, and just have conversation with them. And these kind of mutually beneficial relationships are actually the kind that help reduce people's uh, you know, reports of loneliness. So as we think about how to build a more connected society, which I believe is an essential part of uh, building a country that has a high level of emotional well-being, we have to think about how to build uh, more opportunities to create those mutually beneficial relationships, because that's ultimately what's going to help reduce our rates of loneliness. And you mentioned technology. How does technology play into this? Does technology make things better or worse? It can help us connect, but it's a different kind of connection very often. Yeah, well, you know, techno I'm a big believer in technology. You know, as I, I spent seven years uh, working on and building a technology company because I believed in the power of technology to help improve research in people's lives. Uh, and I think technology can do a whole lot more than that as well. But technology ultimately is a tool, and we can use it for good or for evil, if you will. <laughs> and it, it turns out, when you think about social media in particular, and you look at the data around this, people who use social media as a way station find that it's actually often helpful in reducing loneliness and improving connection versus people who use it as a destination. Using it as a way station, an example of that would be, I'm coming here to San Francisco. I want to check on Facebook to see if any of my friends live in San Francisco so that I can connect with them and hang out while we're here. Using it as a destination might mean that I'm lonely on a given evening and I want to surf my, uh, my news feed and see if I can see what people are up to and feel more connected with them uh, by getting updates on their lives. And while sometimes that might help folks, more often than not, it doesn't seem to help people feel less lonely. And it's not helped by the fact that on social media, many people also um, frame themselves uh, in ways that are, how do I put this charitably, uh, uh, perhaps a little bit more idealistic or aspirational uh, than reality uh, would actually dictate. Uh, and so what that often does is makes people feel sometimes even worse you know, about themselves and their lives. Uh, so using social media as a way station can be really powerful in connecting folks but using it as a destination that's a little bit more complicated but ultimately i think technology has a lot of promise because as we think about how to not just connect people who are friends but how to open people up to new ways of thinking uh, that might be different from their own that's where i think technology has a lot of power and because that's one of our problems right now uh, right now you don't have to interact with anyone who thinks differently than you do you can stay in your corner. You can read the blogs that uh, reaffirm your thinking, find the newspapers that uh, reaffirm your thinking. You can find the people who think exactly like you do and like to yell at the same you know, groups and, uh, and other folks, and you can yell together. You can do all of these things you know, with the power and the assistance of technology. Uh, but if technology can be used to introduce you to new ways of thinking, uh, expose you uh, to people who might think differently than you do, but also share certain things in common, like their values or life experiences, uh, then that can actually be a powerful tool for bringing people together, at least broadening their views so that we start to lessen the divisions that we have between us. Right. Well, speaking of technology, uh, you've been doing a lot of tweeting over the last couple of days. Um, it's really your first public, uh, your public statement since you left your position, and it had to do with the addiction issue we were talking about. And as you've mentioned before, addiction is really a disease of the brain and not a character flaw. Um, I think it was in response to uh, Secretary of Health and Human Service, Tom Price, who was doing his own listening tour and was talking a lot about addiction and, and was really giving mixed messages about the uh, possibility of uh, treating through other medication, what do we call it, medication-assisted uh, medication treatment 
versus sort of the abstinence-only approaches. And I'd seen him talk about both of those things. Uh, um, and you tweeted about the, uh, the scientific basis for the medication-assisted treatment and so forth. Why did you choose to speak out on this issue, particularly at this point? And, and tell us more about why you believe that's the best route. Well, I spent the last couple of years working on addressing substance use and addiction issues. And I did that because everywhere I went, people talked about this being an issue that was tearing their communities apart. And one of the big obstacles that we had to overcome were misconceptions that people had about what addiction was and about how you treat it. And a lot of those misconceptions centered around medication-assisted treatment. Now, medication-assisted treatment, for those who are not familiar with it, uh, is a treatment strategy for generally for addressing a host of addiction issues, but let's talk about opioid addiction uh, specifically. But it's a strategy that involves medication that might be methadone or buprenorphine. Uh, it involves counseling and social support as well. So it's not just medication that you're getting. That's important to know. And when studied carefully over decades, it has been shown that medication-assisted treatment is a proven and effective strategy for reducing overdose deaths and for reduce, reducing relapses. If your goal is to enable people to live full lives and to rebuild their connection with other people, then medication-assisted treatment is a strategy that one should embrace. Now, there's some people uh, who can pursue an abstinence-only path, and they will be just fine. But this is an area where we have to let science drive our policies and drive our decision-making. We can't let opinion, superstition, innuendo drive how we're making decisions as a country. Because in this case, there are literally millions of people's lives that are hanging in the balance. People who have, there are 20.8 million people in America who have a substance use disorder right now. That is nearly the same amount, number of people who have diabetes. That is one and a half times the number of people who have all cancers combined. We have, a, but only one in 10 people with a substance use disorder is actually getting treatment. And at a time where we need to expand treatment and get people connected to treatment, for us to propagate misinformation and myths about medication-assisted treatment is unacceptable and it's unconscionable. And that's why I chose to speak up on that issue and it's why I will continue to speak up throughout the next month, coming months and the coming years because on issues like addiction uh, and on all health issues, uh, we, there's too much at stake for us to allow ourselves to be divided by misinformation and fear-mongering. Uh, we have to let science guide us. We have to establish that science is not the same as someone else's opinion, and we can't create a false equivalence uh, between both in the media or in our, in our conversation circles. And it's especially important that those of us who have a public platform, whether that be because we serve in a particular role in government or we have a respected role uh, in the private sector, it's especially important that if we have a microphone, that we use it responsibly and that we make sure that we know uh, what we're talking about and that we make sure that it's based and grounded in the facts. So you've been... Great. You are a very articulate and passionate advocate of using science to guide our policy decisions. It does seem to me, though, that science right now is on the defensive. And we see that in some of the arguments you were hearing about uh, substance abuse treatment. We certainly see it about vaccination. As you know, there's been a big issue just very recently with the measles outbreak in Minnesota among the Somali population that, from what I read, was targeted with anti-vaccination messages. Again, um, without taking any sides here, it seems like the science is pretty squarely on the side that vaccinations are good for people and do not cause autism, which seems to be the big concern. So with science having a tougher time, not only within healthcare but elsewhere too, how, uh, how can you use science more effectively to guide decisions if it seems to be slipping in public estimation as, uh, as proof of, of usefulness? Well, science is under threat. And I would say more broadly, the truth is under threat. And if we ask the question why, we can come up with any number of reasons, but I would rather focus on the solution. And the solution really lies with each of us. It depends on what we choose to speak up about. It depends on what we choose to share with others. 
And too often, in the face of misunderstandings and misinformation and myths, uh, too many people re remain silent, even though they know better. Now, why do they do this? Well, they do that often because they want to not engage in controversy. They don't want to make someone else upset. But this is a time where, more than ever, it's important for us to speak up for the truth and for science. And I say this particularly to medical students when they're graduating, that their responsibility is not just to the patient who's in front of them, but their responsibility is to all patients everywhere in our country. And the way they serve that responsibility is by speaking up for truth and for reason and for science. And how do we do that? Well, we do that by talking uh, to the people in our lives and making sure that they have the right information. You mentioned the challenges we've been having around myths related to the measles vaccine and autism. And just to be completely clear, in case there's any doubt in the room, uh, there was one study uh, that supposedly showed a connection between uh, the measles vaccine and autism. But that study was debunked multiple times. It was found to be a fraudulent study. Uh, some of the people who were involved in that study actually lost their licenses. And the result of that has been is it has propagated misinformation uh, to millions of people. Uh, and there are people who have made decisions not to get vaccinated as a result of that. Now, we shouldn't, this does not mean that we should never question science, because we should, we should be thoughtful. We should ask ourselves, you know, is the quality of the data that we have good enough? That's always an important question to ask. In the case of the measles vaccine, the quality of that data is incredibly high. Uh, there are few things that have been more scientifically proven and supported uh, than the lack of connection between the measles vaccine and autism. So this is why it's important for us to, to, to know that we need to be soldiers in the war against misinformation, each and every one of us. Uh, I, when I was Surgeon General, part of my responsibility was to get information to the public. But I knew very well that there were many circumstances where the most effective messenger was not necessarily me, but sometimes a person's best friend, or their mother, or their father, or their wife or husband, and sometimes their kid, right? And so each of us are someone's friend, someone's you know, son or daughter. In some cases, you might be someone's mother or father. And you have the ability to help educate and inform them and that's what we have to do. We all have to be soldiers fighting for truth uh, in this day and age. Because what we're battling against is a, a wave of misinformation. And it's not always malicious, but it spreads often quite easily, like on the internet. Uh, and that which alarms people tends to spread the fastest. Uh, so yes, we, we do have a situation where science and the truth have been challenged. Uh, but we will only overcome that uh, if each of us sees in our own roles and our own lives a responsibility to stand up for and to defend the truth, regardless of where the misinformation is coming from, regardless of whether it's coming from our bosses, whether it's coming from high government officials, uh, whether it's coming from other prominent people in our community, we have to stand up and defend the truth and speak up for reason. Because when we stop doing that is when we abdicate our society. It's when we give in to forces that can ultimately lead us into darkness. And I'm not prepared to do that because my parents came to this country 40 years ago because they saw a lot of light. And I want to make sure that my son grows up in a country that also has a lot of light. All right. Thank you. Very inspiring. <laughs> well, let me lighten things a little bit by um, asking you about the role of happiness and gratitude in health. Mm -hmm. What do we know about it? What does the research actually say? Is it actually just touchy-feely stuff, or is there some science behind that? Well, th this is a fascinating area, thinking about how to actually improve emotional well-being. And tell, let me tell you why this is exciting to me, because a lot of times when, if you understand that emotions are tightly connected to your health, that your emotional well-being drives your health, as well as economic you know, productivity, as well as educational outcomes, et cetera. If you understand that, then the next question is, can I cultivate emotional well-being? Or does it just happen to me as a consequence of the circumstances in my life? 
And the good news is that science tells us you can actually cultivate emotional well-being. And when I would speak about this, you know, uh, during my time as Surgeon General, it would come as a surprise to people who often thought that their lot was their lot in life. And if that made them happy or sad, that was just how it was. But it turns out the tools for cultivate, cultivating emotional well-being are relatively simple uh, and of low cost. And those include sleep, which actually has a powerful impact on your emotional well-being. It includes physical activity, which can often actually be an acute antidepressant, which it took me years to realize, you know, when I was going through school and everything. But now these days, if I'm feeling down, going for a run uh, is sometimes the, the best thing to do or going to the gym. As my wife often tells me, she's, if she senses that I'm feeling down, she's like, just go lift something heavy. It'll make you feel better. <laughs> but exercise can be incredibly powerful. Contemplative practices like gratitude, and exer uh, gratitude exercises and meditation can also be incredibly powerful at lifting our mood in the short term and in the long term. And social connection is a critical piece of that as well. Also very powerful in enhancing our emotional well-being. So we have tools. The question is, do people know about these tools? Are we building these tools into our lives, into our workplaces and our schools, uh, and into how we function at home? Uh, and here, there's a lot of possibility. Because when I was, over the last year and a half or so, I, I spent time visiting programs around the country that were focused on emotional well-being. I visited a program in Chicago, for example, that took at-risk young men and brought them together once a week to learn skills of conflict resolution. Uh, and really to connect with each other, to build social connection. That program in, in one year was able to reduce violent arrests among those young men by 44% compared to a control group. 44%. I visited a school actually not too far from here, on the outskirts of San Francisco, a school that was uh, really hard hit uh, by social circumstances and, and a tough environment. It's called Visitation Valley uh, Middle School, or Vis Valley. And Viz Valley had a, a really tough situation. More than half of the kids had at least one parent that was incarcerated. Rates of violence in the community were high. In one year alone, before they had started their programs, there were over 50 people uh, that were murdered. They tried so many things uh, to address uh, the well-being of the kids in school, and they just had a really hard time. Suspension rates were high, grades were low, teacher burnout was through the roof. And they started a meditation program there, almost on a whim, actually by chance. But there was a researcher who was focused on, uh, on, on meditation, looking at the impact on children. And he began this program called Quiet Time uh, at the school, twice daily uh, meditation. Uh, it was approximately 15 minutes, uh, twice a day. And they taught middle school students, 6th, 7th, and 8th graders, how to meditate. And if that sounds like an improbable proposition to you, <laughs> I will tell you that I was wondering the same. And so I actually went to visit the school and to meditate with the kids and to talk to them about what their experiences were like. And as you might expect, they were kind of skeptical in the beginning, wondering like if this was what this uh, was, if it was hokey, et cetera. And then they, with some continued instruction, got into it. And what they realized at the school was within just a few weeks of starting the meditation practice, the volume in the hallways started to go down. Then they started noticing that the whiteboard outside the principal's office, which had a list of teachers who called in sick, started to get shorter and shorter. <laughs> and shorter until one day the whiteboard was empty. In two years, they reduced suspensions by over 70%. They saw grades go up. They saw the reported health uh, issues that kids were bringing up actually go down. And when I talked to the kids, I asked them, I was like, well, tell me what this actually did for you. These two girls were sitting next to each other, and one turned to the other. They were both teammates on the basketball team. And uh, one of the girls said to the other, she said, you know, after you started meditating, you became a better teammate. And the other girl looked at her kind of offended. She was like, I was a pretty good teammate before. What was wrong? Mm. And she said, no, you used to kind of hog the ball when it got toward the end of the game. You were worried uh, about not getting enough points up on the board, and so you would try to shoot too much yourself instead of passing to others. And she said, but after you started meditating, you seemed calmer. You seemed like you were more, more grounded, uh, and you didn't get as flustered when things got, got difficult, like in those basketball games. Another boy, Tony, actually told me that he grew up in a really tough circumstance where his uh, parents, um, his parents weren't able to provide him the support that you would hope that every kid would have. His mother was struggling with addiction. She left when he was uh, a small child. His father worked three jobs. It wasn't often there for him. Uh, and he faced a lot of discrimination in school. And as a result of that, uh, he, he felt really angry. Uh, and he just assumed that he was an angry person. He bullied other kids uh, all the time. 
after he started meditating, and he was skeptical in the beginning too, but when he started meditating, he had his moment of calm. It was very brief. It lasted maybe a second, but it made him pause. That was his aha moment. He's like, hey, that kind of felt good. <laughs> He's like, if that felt good, maybe I'm not an angry person. Maybe I'm actually a calm person. And he would think about that moment when he was confronted with somebody who wanted to fight with him or provoke him. And he would just stop and he'd say, hey, I'm actually, I'm not an angry person. I'm a calm person. Eventually, he found the kids that he bullied and he apologized to them. Today, he's actually teaching meditation uh, to other kids. Uh, his grades actually went up. His father uh, noticed that his behavior at home was better, which is a common experience that many of the kids' parents actually had. So what's exciting to me about this area is that there are tools that are scientifically proven to help enhance our emotional well-being, which can then translate into better health outcomes, better educational outcomes, better productivity in the workplace, which can also drive improvements in our civic engagement. We talk about wanting people to vote in this country. We bemoan the fact that people don't get to the polls whenever we have elections. But if you're experiencing a tremendous amount of stress in your lives, are you more or less likely to go to the polls and participate and execute your civic duty than if you're in a good place emotionally? You're less likely to. And you're less likely to also go out and volunteer, uh, even though that can actually can help you uh, with your emotional well-being. So our efforts to bring scientifically proven emotional well-being practices into our vernacular, into our public conversation, into our programs in schools and the workplaces, and into our policies so that we are investing in research and in the implementation and scaling of these programs, these are really important. These are really timely because if you care about how our kids do in school, you care about emotional well-being. If you care about our productivity in businesses across America, you should care about emotional well-being. If you care about the fact that we have an epidemic of addiction and chronic disease, you should care about emotional well-being. And if you want greater civic engagement and investment in the well-being of our country from its citizens, then you should care about emotional well-being. So emotional well-being is something that is quite attainable, as expensive as medical care is. Most of the things you're talking about are cheap or free. They're fairly easy. You can do it yourself very often, right? It's amazing. This is worth the price of admission, by the way, everybody. <laughs> uh, we're going to go to questions in about four or five minutes to so start thinking about your questions. And if you like, you can line up by the microphone in the back of the room over there. Uh, meanwhile, I want to t turn more to kind of what you're doing next. You know, the New York Times reported last month, this was in the article when they announced that you were leaving, they said, there's a long history of Surgeons General creating unwanted controversy for their political bosses. And among the only ways that the government's top medics usually gain attention is when they leave office. They also said under a cloud as well. Now, you haven't really left under a cloud, but you've left with some notoriety there too. And my question to you is, do you think given, given of course, you want to continue your mission of communicating some of these things and encouraging the country to, to change its, its ways and, and get better emotional well-being, do you think that in some ways uh, this experience you've had over the last few weeks might actually help you gain visibility to get your message out? <laughs> Well, that's trying to look at the bright side here. Yeah, no, there are a lot of bright sides, actually. <laughs> and um, one thing that I've been really gratified by uh, over the last few weeks is um, just incredible outpouring of support that I've heard from people all across the country, uh, most of whom I had never met, but people who were in some way touched by the work that we did, but more importantly, by the conversations that we were all having about topics like emotional well-being. And what these, re what these reaffirmed to me, these... Uh, sort of notes and messages that I got from people all across the country was that it is so important for us to keep working on these critical public health issues. Uh, the, whether I'm in office or not, whether I'm wearing a uniform or not, does not change how important this is for the country. It doesn't change the fact that I'm a citizen of the United States still interested and invested in the well-being of our country. And that's why I intend to continue focusing on strategies that we can use to build a movement around emotional well-being in our country, a movement that will inform our programs, our policies, and how we lead our day-to-day -day lives. Uh, it is true that sometimes the best way to get attention is to say something controversial. I'm not a fan of that strategy, although many people use it to great effect. Mm -hmm. uh, but, <laughs> but, uh -huh. did I hit a nerve there? Mm -hmm. <laughs> But what I do think is important is that we talk about the issues that are striking a chord in people. And it turns out that emotional well-being is one of those because there are millions of people in America who are dealing with chronic stress uh, and with pain. And that's something that we have to respond to. 
and if we think about if we think about what the possibilities are, if we improve the emotional well-being of our kids in school, uh, can you imagine what, how much brighter their futures would be? Can you imagine how much less likely they would be to get into trouble with the law? How much better they might do actually on their exams? How, much, how many more opportunities they may have uh, going forward? How much better their behavior might be at home if you're a parent? Uh, there is a tremendous amount of gain that we can make from a relatively small investment emotional and emotional well-being. But here's what we have to guard against. As a country, we have historically not been terribly interested in prevention. We've usually invested the lion's share of our resources in treatment. We get fascinated by fancy new cures and medical devices. And those are important, don't get me wrong. Because we have invested so much in treatment, we have some of the best treatments in the world. And we have to continue those investments, but we are today paying the price of not investing sufficiently in prevention. Uh, nobody I met during my entire time as Surgeon General ever said, I would rather get diabetes and get treated than prevent it in the first place. Nobody said that. Mm -hmm. People want to prevent chronic illness. They want to prevent violence before it begins. They want their kids to have a brighter future that's not in danger. And that requires us to invest in prevention. And the only way as a country we're gonna invest in prevention is if we start at home and if we demand it of our elected leaders. Because right now, I will tell you, uh, members of Congress are not feeling a whole lot of heat from their constituents about investing in prevention. No one's banging the door down to get more dollars to teach kids about tools to enhance their emotional fitness and their emotional well-being, even though that could save billions of dollars and a tremendous amount of pain and suffering. People are banging the doors to invest at the tail end they want more support for you know, treatment and for cures. And that's important, but we have to increase the pressure to invest in prevention. Great, thank you. We are going to go to our questions from the audience. That's our first question. Dr. Murthy, what an absolute honor it is to have you here this evening. And uh, my name is Courtney Rice, and I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you for being here. Um, so, emotional well-being and access. I feel as a woman that there's a little bit of an elephant in the room here. We haven't talked about women. We haven't talked about reproductive access. We haven't talked about the um, opportunity, uh, education, sex education. We haven't talked about the fact that there is this huge erosion in our country for women to have access to healthcare, reproductive healthcare, access to birth control, access to abortion. And so we talk about loneliness, we talk about drug addiction, and yet one of the most important things, I think in terms of our healthy community, our healthy American United States community, has to do with women have, having access to these things. Great. And I find it just um, a problem. So we skipped over that, it seems to me. Great. Thank you. Well, I'm glad you brought that up. And there are, if we had a lot of time, we could talk about a whole bunch of issues, but this is a very important one. And the bottom line here is we, we have to stop treating women as second-class citizens when it, when it comes to health. And that's what we do right now with access, right? We, no, nobody is trying to restrict men's access to Viagra. <laughs> but we have plenty of people who are trying to, and they often tend to be men, who are trying to determine whether or not uh, women have choices when it comes to their reproductive health. And t to me, this is, I mean, this is uh, incredibly problematic, but it's particularly problematic when it comes to basic things like access, access to care, access to medications, access to reproductive choices. You know, we have, we have spent so many years litigating issues around coverage. And as a doctor, I have seen the consequences of people not having coverage. I've seen the consequences of women not having the freedom to make decisions for themselves. You know, in addition to practicing medicine here in, in America, I spent many years working on projects in India, including in some of the poorest parts of India, where women have very few, little choice when it comes to their health and their health care. And that bodes poorly for outcomes. And I don't think a society can be strong uh, without supporting uh, its women, and particularly around issues of health. And I worry that we are going down a similar path 
uh, in our country when it comes to restrictions uh, around access and choice. Now, how do we fix that as a country? Well, we have, you know, over the last several decades, seen a pretty strong debate in our country about whether the government should pay for some of these services, uh, whether it's access to abortion services, whether it's access to birth control. And, you know, I think that unless, my concern is that when members of Congress are making decisions on these issues, when they're crafting health policy legislation, uh, I don't think that many of them feel that there's going to be much of a consequence for them if they go with the party line and restrict access. And you, you can view that two ways. You can blame the member of Congress, or you can look at their constituents and say that it's now all of our collective responsibilities as citizens to put our vote uh, where it counts, to be vocal about holding those members of Congress accountable and to organize other people in our communities to do the same. And that last piece of organizing other people in our community is, I believe, more than ever what we have to do right now. Because if we each speak up with our individual voices, that's important. But there are people who are not here in this room or listening on the radio. They're your friends, they're your family members, and we have to engage and mobilize them too. And when, on those occasions where people do speak, powerfully with one voice, they can and often have pushed elected leaders to listen. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't happen uh, all the time, and particularly when it has come uh, to access uh, to coverage, both for men and women, but particularly to access to reproductive uh, health care services, uh, that has not happened often enough. So there are some good champions in Congress, but we need a lot more. There is no reason that any member of Congress given the science that we have and the data that we have showing that access to contraception, for example, is critical for ensuring the health of a woman and her child, given all the data that we have, there is no reason in 2017 that any member of Congress should be trying to restrict that access. It makes no sense medically, and it makes no sense from a humane perspective. Right. Thanks for the question. We'll take another, please try to keep your questions short so we can go through as many as possible. Hi, my name is Anne. I recently graduated from UC Berkeley with a bachelor's in public health. And in our classes, we often talk about um, inequities. And so I wanted you to comment about um, if you're coming from a minority background when our communities don't even have that dialogue about mental illness being an actual thing where physical health is regarded but not mental health, how do marginalized communities or minority communities specifically talk about that? And especially also in the United States where mental health is, more, is stigmatized as well. Well, thank you for that question. The, you mentioned Asian American uh, community members experiencing the stigma around mental illness. Uh, you know, as someone who comes from an Asian American family, I can tell you it has been alive and well in, in my community as well. And, uh, and that's really unfortunate. I had an uncle um, who, I had an uncle who, um, who took his own life when I was younger, when I was uh, in, in 11th grade, actually. And it was a really horrifying moment uh, for me and my family, where we wondered if we had done something wrong, if we had missed the signs, if we had failed him. Uh, but it was hard to talk about. Uh, with other people in the community because we felt this weird sensitivity uh, and almost a sense of shame around it. And the only way that changes is if people choose to speak up. We can't legislate away stigma. Uh, we can't put regulations in place uh, that dissolve it. Uh, the only way we can change stigma is by individuals speaking up and demonstrating a different way of thinking, a different way of being. And that's why it's, more, it's so, so important uh, that folks who are impacted by mental illness in their families actually speak up and share their stories. That's very hard. That's an easy thing to say. It's a very hard thing to do, incredibly hard. But it's because people have chosen to speak up that we are actually starting to see the tide turn on how people look at addiction uh, in America. It's because more and more people sp uh, spoke up that we see less stigma around mental illness now than we did 50 years ago. Does that mean we're done? Absolutely not. But it does mean that we need more people to speak up and to share their stories. Thank you. We're going to take just these four folks left in line. So all of you with other questions, share them on Twitter, and we'll hopefully Dr. Murthy will get to those one day. <laughs> Our next question. Thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Murthy, for being here and for being an example of 
a, a vocal South Asian American in politics speaking out on social justice issues, um, which is not actually all that common in the South Asian community. I think there is often a sense of discomfort around acknowledging um, not only stress in others, but also the stress that we cause others and understanding the intersectional forms of oppression that manifest in people's identities and all those kinds of stress, the disproportionate stress that people of color experience. How do you think that we can leverage that discomfort and not shy away from it as allies to work towards eliminating the need for those kinds of stressors in the first place? Well, it's, uh, well first of all, thank you uh, for, for your comments and, uh, and your kind words. I, I recognize that if we're going to address uh, stress in this country, it's not going to be simple. And we have to have, as I think about it, an inside and outside approach. On the outside, we have to recognize the stressors that are driving the experience that people are having, the stressors being poverty and violence and discrimination, among others. And we have to recognize that we have to apply ourselves to fixing those structural factors uh, that are contributing to stress in people's lives. But we also have to, I believe, work on the inside strategy, which is to equip people with the tools that we know work to make them more resilient in the face of adversity, and that also enhance their ability to function at higher and higher ends uh, on their emotional uh, well-being scale. And doing both is important because we sometimes get caught in this polarized debate where we say, you know what, it's all the environment, and we've got to fix the environment or nothing's going to change, or it's all people's internal will, and they just have to pull themselves up by their bootstraps, and they can't keep blaming the environment. And the truth is that we have to work on the inside and the outside. Some of the stories I shared with you uh, earlier about a, the, the young boy uh, you know, in San Francisco and the, the boys in uh, Chicago uh, who were part of emotional well-being programs that changed their lives, uh, they are still living in communities that have a lot of structural problems. There is still bracing poverty, extreme violence in their communities, and we have to address those. But they are better off today because they are equipped with tools that they can use to help them in the process. And that's what I think that we have to, to, to recognize and focus on and really see that larger picture. Great, thank you. Yeah. Next question. Hi, Dr. Vivek. Thank you so much for your time and for your service. I am a CEO of a mobile health company, and we are highly concerned about the allocation of resources and the fact that the most limited resource we have in medicine is the amount of time that doctors can give care. How can we achieve great health when there is no alignment between healthcare economics and for-profit insurance? Hmm. Well, good, good question. <laughs> Well, for anyone who's under the illusion that healthcare is set up in a rational way, <laughs> I will certainly have to burst your bubble. But you're absolutely right that the, the incentives in medicine are not aligned. Uh, you know, when I was uh, practicing medicine up in Boston, it was the case that a hospital actually could do better financially if it didn't take such good care of a patient and they had to come back with complications. That, it's not a good idea to pit the business model against the humanitarian goal. And what we really need uh, to do if we really want to accelerate the move to better care uh, and higher quality care is we need to align those incentives. And some of the work actually that was coming out of the Affordable Care Act was in fact moving toward exactly just that, was moving toward value-based payment systems where we pay for value instead of volume. Uh, and, and that's good, and we need those programs to actually continue and to accelerate. We need the private sector, private insurers, to actually build value-based models as well. And some of them have actually, many of them, have started to move in that direction too. But there is actually another uh, complication that we have to think about, which is that if we're just thinking about healthcare in isolation, and the value that health, the, the money that comes into healthcare is an investment, and the value that comes out of it, we have to recognize that the value spills over into other sectors as well. So if we have a, system, a health system that's working well in investing in prevention, some of that value will actually accrue to the education sector, and kids will be less sick, they'll be in school more, and they'll do better. Some of that value will accrue to businesses uh, whose employees will get less sick and hopefully will contribute more uh, in, in the workplace. But we don't really factor that in in our accounting, and we might see health as a cost center, whereas in reality it's generating a lot of extra benefit for other sectors. 
And this is also why we started to see uh, some experimentation through the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services uh, under the ACA, the Affordable Care Act. We started to see a growing investment in accountable health communities, which are thinking not just about how do I give a hospital sum, a pot of money to create better health, but how do I actually go to a community and say that to be truly healthy, transportation and education and housing and health all have to work together to actually create the environment in which people can thrive, uh, recognizing that the vast majority of your health is not determined in your hospital. It's determined in your community. Uh, and so that's the model, actually, that I think we need to increasingly move toward. And it is a shift in the traditional healthcare economic model that we've had. And as we have discussions about the possibility of repealing and replacing uh, the Affordable Care Act and about uh, what that replacement could look like, it's a, important for us to keep our eye on the ball when it comes to changing the payment model, because that actually isn't very much a part of the conversation that's happening right now. Uh, I, many people aren't aware that the investments made in the ACA did a huge amount to push us forward uh, toward changing that business model so that we were paying for better care and not just for more care. Uh, and that's what we got to keep an eye out for in these replacement bills. If they, get, if they move us back in the other direction uh, toward more of a fee-for-service based system, which certainly worked well for some people and made them quite wealthy, but that didn't work out so well for patients, and that would mean taking us back in time and not forward. Thank you. Next question. Hello, Dr. Murthy. I share your vision. Um, I'm the first born here from India. Uh, my father was born in India, uh, and, and I was born here. My I didn't mean my grandfather either. But I remember the stories that my father shared with me and how he had the hope of coming to America and, and really making a change. And so he did for us. It was really amazing. Um, so I'm the executive director of a nonprofit in, called All Care Plus. And we work with a number of people in the community to holistically reduce chronic disease in vulnerable populations. But something that we've seen um, an interesting concept is that many people have no idea of where their health really stands. And in the lower income where they have no insurance and they're low income, they're, they're struggling to find out what their status is. So I'm thinking that that in relation to mental health are issues that need to be addressed. And those, those are things that we are trying to address. But another factor is the criminal justice system. So you see the criminal justice system is... Um, really impacting is kind of working towards and making a difference. So I'm just telling you, from your point of view, where you've had as a Surgeon General, and you've had that bird's eye point of view, where do you feel we are in a spectrum of, you know, trying to um, say one to 10, 10 being the best, or, you know, more the criminal justice system, and one being the self-help, uh, where do you feel we are in trying to you know, put these processes like stress and meditation and putting those things to help combat the illnesses that are putting people in jail and prisons? Mm. Well, it's a good question, and we are not nearly as far along as we need to be. But I will tell you that we have come far enough along uh, in terms of implementing uh, emotional well-being type programs that you're mentioning, uh, programs that help reduce uh, the risk of illness and incarceration. We have done enough of that uh, to know that it works. We've done enough of that to know that it can be done without breaking the bank. Uh, we're investing relatively little for a fairly large outcome. Uh, but there are a couple of problems, uh, which is that while we may know that, we all know very well that knowing something and having good data doesn't necessarily mean that that translates into scalable program and investments. Right? And sometimes it can take many, many years for an idea that has been proven to work to translate into change at scale. Uh, and now, sometimes that change has to come from the government actually investing and shifting policy, and sometimes it can move through the private sector. When you're talking about criminal justice, uh, that is an area where the government has to actually be very directly involved. We were making uh, some good progress in moving away from a jail people with illness philosophy to a treat people with illness philosophy, particularly when it came to addiction. My concern is I don't see the same commitment to doing, moving in that direction uh, in the current administration. And that concerns me because with diseases like addiction, we spent decades 
fighting a war on drugs that ended up becoming a war on the people who use drugs. And that cost us dearly in terms of not just lives and the value that those lives could have brought to society, but those destroyed trust in communities who saw their loved ones being locked up and what they needed was help. And it made me very proud uh, to work in an administration uh, when President Obama was in office that recognized that explicitly, that chose to speak up about the importance of decriminalizing uh, offenses that were uh, nonviolent uh, and that were really illnesses, diseases like addiction. Uh, but I'm worried that we don't hear that same commitment uh, right now. Now, benefit of the doubt, maybe that commitment is there and it hasn't surfaced yet. I'm still waiting, <laughs> and I hope it will. But in the absence of that commitment surfacing, this is again one of those times where we have to think about how we hold our elected leaders accountable. Too many people feel that there is a political benefit to be gained by appearing tough on crime, by incarcerating people and demanding longer mandatory minimums. And why did they believe that? Because it often proves to be true at the polls. And it will continue to prove to be true at the polls until voters decide that they won't reward politicians who function on values that aren't consistent with our own. We are, I believe, still, despite everything we have been through, we are a nation that is compassionate and that is kind. That's what I saw as Surgeon General in every community that I visited. It's what my family has experienced. Uh, it's not to say we never experienced discrimination and violence. We did. But overwhelmingly, we experienced far more kindness and compassion. We need to reflect that kindness and compassion in the people we elect and in the laws that we pass. And the way we do that is by showing up at the ballot box, by using our voice to speak up when those values are not being executed on, and by making sure that we bring each other along in this struggle, because this is a struggle to preserve what makes our country truly great, which is our values, not the, our might or our bluster or how much you know, we saber rattle. That's not what makes our country great. What makes our country truly great is our values. It makes me so proud that our country gives more to philanthropy than any other country in the world. That's an expression of the compassion and kindness of the American people. It makes me proud that when there has been, whenever there's a disaster, when a, country, a county or a city is leveled by a hurricane or a tornado, people from all over our country step up and respond and send aid and go and volunteer. My wife was in New York when 9-11 happened and she went to volunteer and she told me that there were people who quit their jobs and came from the most remote parts of the country to help and volunteer in New York City, even though they had never been there because they felt a kinship to fellow Americans who were hurt. Those are the values that have to guide us. And if our politicians don't abide by and support and exemplify those values, then we need to find different leaders. Well, we are so inspiring. Um, um, I'm afraid we're about out of time, so we have to ask just the one final question. This is the informed tradition to ask all of our speakers this question. What is your 60-second idea to change the world? We have to teach our children to be moral leaders. That will transform our country and our world. We teach our kids about arithmetic, about writing, but we don't teach them to be moral leaders who identify, live, and stand up for the values that make our society work. Values of compassion and generosity, values of kindness, I believe that there are really only two, two factors that drive all of our decisions. Those are love and fear. Love and its manifestations is kindness and generosity and compassion. Fear has its own manifestations of jealousy, cynicism, insecurity, and rage. But these are the two factors that drive our decisions. And right now, our world is locked in a struggle between love and fear. And we have to do everything we can to tip that balance toward love. And the way that we do that is by ensuring that those values that are centered in love are ingrained in each of us, and particularly in our children from a young age. We need to ensure that they have, are exposed to those values, that we model those values for them, and that we reward that kind of value when it's demonstrated and exhibited in behavior and speech. Right. 
That's what we have to do. And if we do that, if we create a nation of moral leaders, then we can truly be the country that we can ultimately be. We can live in a way that's consistent with our highest values. And we can not only improve health, but we can improve fulfillment, satisfaction, and joy for everyone. That's what we have to do. Well, please join me in thanking Dr. Vivek Murthy for sharing his thoughts with us this evening at the Inform at the Commonwealth Club. I'm Mark Sitter of the Zedema Project. Thank you and good night.